Great, let's make a start. Thanks ever so much for joining us this morning. My name is Cathy Creswell. I'm from the Departments of Experimental Psychology and Psychiatry here at the University of Oxford. And I'm really delighted to be hosting this series, which is hosted by the Department of Experimental Psychology on our mental wellness. Um, we've had a really great series of talks so far, and I'm delighted to introduce this one, which is focused on coping with trauma. So just to tell you a little bit about how this all works, we'll have about um, 15 or 20 minutes talk, first of all, and then we're going to open up for a panel discussion. Because um, of the nature of the subjects that we're talking about, because we know there are a lot of questions, and because we record and um, share this on YouTube, we don't have a live question answer session. So many thanks to those of you who've submitted questions in advance. We've collated those and pulled them together into themes that we'll be presenting to our panel. We'll be finishing at about quarter to 11 and we deliberately leave it as 15 minutes to the hour. So there's a bit of time at the end, hopefully for you to have a bit of a break before your next appointment or activity um, starts up because obviously the issues that we are covering in these series we understand may raise difficulties for some people um, and give people lots to think about. So we want to give you a chance to take a bit of time, encourage you to give yourself a bit of a break, go for a bit of a walk or, or whatever would be helpful for you just to give yourself a little bit of time at the end of the session. Before we start, I also just want to highlight that we've had um, previous talks on some fantastic topics, including overcoming stress and anxiety, overcoming depression and low mood, overcoming problems with sleep and also with eating. So please do have a look at the Department of Experimental Psychology website or our YouTube channel where you can watch back those talks, which have all been really, uh, really useful. Um, and interesting sessions. And we also have another talk coming up um, shortly, which is focused uh, on um, overcoming paranoia, which will be led by um, Dan Freeman from the Department of Psychiatry. So please do also join us for that one. But without further ado, I'm re really delighted to introduce Professor Anka Ellis, who's from the Department of Experimental Psychology. Anka is Professor of Experimental Psychopathology and a Wellcome Trust Principal Research Fellow here, and is also co-director of the Oxford Centre for Anxiety Disorders and Trauma. So thanks ever so much for joining us today, Anka. Thank you very much, Cathy, for your kind introduction. And uh, thanks for everybody uh, to, for joining us today. I'll quickly go to and share my screen. And um, yeah, so my topic is coping with trauma, but let's first look at what, what, do, how, what do we understand what a trauma is. In everyday language, we use a very broad definition of it and talk about upsetting events, such as uh, losing a job, failing an exam, or a divorce as potentially as traumatic. And in, me in medical uh, science, uh, trauma often refers to physical injury. What I'm going to talk about uh, is slightly different. It's a kind of narrower definition of upsetting events that cause a psychological trauma. And th th those traumas are extremely threatening events, or it can be a series of repeated events that often involve the threat to one owns one's own life or physical integrity or that of other people. And examples would be interpersonal violence such as assault, torture and so on, severe accidents, natural and man-made disasters or war zone experience. But it's very broad what, what uh, the type of events that, that can, uh, can be called trauma because they involve the threat to life or physical integrity. And what is really uh, important to highlight here is that what matters is the subjective experience at the time. So even people who are in the, in the same event differ in whether they experience the event as a trauma. And uh, to give you an example, so uh, let's say somebody is threatened with a toy gun uh, in a mugging or something like that. And if the person at the time believes that's a real gun, and they are about to be shot, this could be a psychological trauma, even they, though they might find out shortly afterwards that it was just a toy gun. So whether it's subjectively perceived as a threat to life or physical integrity. 
So my next question is how common is this type of experience? And we have a quick poll prepared for you to get your opinion. Well, how many people do you think have experienced such an event in their lifetime? Thank you very much. The results are coming in now. So, so we, we can see that most of you estimated between 30 and 60%. That's a very good uh, guess. Uh, it, it is a common experience. And um, some of you, and the, the second largest guess was between 60 and 90%. So, so you are very much uh, there on target. It is actually, even though these are extreme events, they are actually common. And uh, if we uh, now go to, to my, uh, my next, uh, next slide, um, then um, we, we can, sorry, I can't. So hopefully you see, see now some examples from, um, from uh, recent events that were reported widely in the media. So anything from accidents, from fire terrorist attacks, uh, natural disasters and so on are very common. And the research actually shows that most people will experience at least one traumatic event in their lifetime. Uh, for example, a large study recently conducted by the World Health Organization interviewed nearly 70,000 people in 24 countries. And 70% in the studies reported trauma. And actually, on average, it was three traumas per person. The most common uh, re events reported were in this survey were unexpected death of a loved one or witnessing harm to other people and road horrific accidents. How do people respond to trauma? What happens in the aftermath? There is a set of typical symptoms and this is one of the reasons why the definition of trauma uh, in psychology and psychiatry is quite, uh, quite has been narrowed down. But, uh, among the most common symptoms after such events are re-experiencing symptoms where people experience moments from the event, uh, memories, dreams, or just the emotions or body sensations from the trauma as if they are, were happening again right now. So people may have pictures from the event popping into their mind or they may dream about them. Um, and among body sensations they experience could be the, the, like the heart race and all the, the physiological responses during the event. And it really feels as if the trauma is happening now. And if you have such unpleasant memories of the event that are highly distressing, it is very understandable that people will go out of their way to avoid reminders of the event. This could be similar situations like going to the site of the event, people who were involved uh, or even thinking or talking about the event is extremely uh, distressing and therefore is avoided very commonly. And finally, um, there's uh, many symptoms of being in a state of high alert, being on edge, uh, looking out for danger being easily started, but also difficulty sleeping and concentrating. And that is very understandable after an upsetting event, uh, such as the ones I described. Um, and what is important to emphasize here that these symptoms are entirely normal after a traumatic event. And most people will have so some re-experiencing symptoms soon after the event and some avoidance and some high, how arisal. That doesn't mean necessarily that this is a clinical de condition developing. It's just a normal response to an abnormal situation. Um, but it, for some people, it can become a more chronic problem that they have these kinds of symptoms. And this is what we then call post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and this uh, disorder is characterized by exactly the same symptoms that everybody would experience and also often negative thoughts about the self or feeling quite numb, being losing interest in things people used to enjoy and having lots of negative emotion, uh, including sadness, anger, feeling guilty or ashamed and so on. 
But none of that immediately after the trauma is, 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 is a cause of concern, because as you will see on my next slide, um, people are often resilient and recover from these symptoms on their own. And this is a slide from the same stu study that I just mentioned from the World Health Organization. And people were uh, answering questions of how long after the, the event, the symptoms persisted. And what you can see, and, and the plot just highlights different types of trauma. So let's just look at the overall picture. You can see that in the first year, um, and, and what's plotted here is years after the trauma. So in the first year, we see a really very steep recovery. So, so quite a lot of people, 25 to 40% will fully recover from the PTSD symptoms in the first year after the trauma. And even after that, recovery is still ongoing. You see here one, uh, one uh, group where the, the recovery takes longer, and this is from war zone uh, related trauma. So, so, but for all other traumas, it's quite a fast recovery in the first year. So this now raises the question. So, so if we see that men, these symptoms are quite normal after the event, it's an abnormal event and we react to that, we have to readjust uh, our lives after having an experience like this. Um, and mo many people will recover on their own. So what do we know about what helps recovery? So that, we, that what prevents people from being stuck in this recovery process, which is how we understand developing PTSD. So one uh, big factor there is support from family, friends, and colleagues. So if we have support from other people that are close to us, that care about us, that, that will be helpful. Um, also, generally looking after ourselves, self-care. So really watching out to eat, eat well after an event like this, to um, not use uh, substances excessively, not, not drink too much alcohol and so on, get some exercise, and also generally be kind to yourself and don't, don't feel you have to really back to, be back to normal in a few days. This is a very upsetting uh, event that shakes people up and, and we won't be able to overcome it in a day. But as you, if we let the natural recovery with the support of our friends and colleagues and, and family uh, take place, then, then, then we have a good chance of recovering. The other um, tip I would give from our clinical work uh, on post-traumatic stress disorder, that often people who end up having a post-traumatic stress disorder give up a lot of activities that were important to them before and, and they enjoyed, um, and that could be a direct effect of the trauma uh, let's say they were injured and can't do certain activities, but even then if the injuries are healed and they can, could resume this activity, often then don't quite get around to doing this. And so what, one uh, advice I would give is step-by-step step, uh, trying to reclaim activities that bring meaning and enjoyment to our lives. And even if, if um, one might not feel like this immediately after an event. You might feel, oh, it's, it's, there's no point to it. I'm um, really getting back into a daily routine where this is a part. And this may need to involve finding some alternatives if, if you can't do certain things any longer after trauma. So for, so for instance, let's say uh, somebody has a leg injury and can't play football any longer, they may still be able to do some form of exercise, like go to the gym or uh, go swimming and so on. That, that really ticks the same box in, in, in bringing meaning and enjoyment to, to, to their lives. That's obviously easier said than done, but so it takes a little bit of a, a decision to get going again with these activities, but we find them extremely helpful. The other point I wanted to consider is what gets in the way in the way of recovery. So how do some people uh, get stuck and develop PTSD after trauma? And uh, one thing I wanted to mention is that people 
uh, can get stuck in world vicious cycles between uh, the threat that they, they've taken from the trauma, threatening meanings of the trauma and, it, and, and also its aftermath, including the symptoms of PTSD themselves. So I will give some examples in a minute. And the second is uh, when you have, uh, when you feel the trauma is still posing a threat in your life. So let's say you feel you're going to be attacked again, you will take measures to prevent this. And, and the crux here is that some of these very understandable strategies that people take to control the threat they are now perceiving in their life um, to, will actually backfire and either increase symptoms or, or maintain the problem so, so that you kind of keep stuck in this vicious circle. And as a um, way to um, introduce this, I just wanted you to do a little experiment with me for just a short moment. So if in the next few moments, I would like you to, you can think about anything you like, but there's one particular thing I would, you under no circumstances should think about. And this is a black and white cat sitting on my shoulder. So you can think about anything else, but don't think about that cat. So what, what happened? Um, I would hope uh, it, uh, it would have illustrated to you that it's really hard not to think about it, something. So many people who do this experiment will say, well, immediately an image of a cat popped into my mind. And this is exactly what, what uh, seems to be going on uh, in people who develop PTSD after trauma as well. They, they will have un many unwanted memories of a trauma popping into our mind, as I explained. This is a normal experience after trauma. But if they then think uh, this means something bad about themselves, for instance, they might think I'm going crazy I'm not, I'm losing it. Uh, I won't be able to my, do my job and ever again. They will then try very hard to push these memories out of their mind. But as hopefully you will experience yourself, this actually has a paradoxical effect that actually these, these memories pop into your mind more. So it's kind of increases the chances of having unwanted memories, which then confirms them uh, their idea that they might be going crazy and losing it and it might push even harder and 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 they got you know, get stuck in this vicious circle so so we would want to break through these these vicious circles after trauma another example here where it's more about um, some a meaning that a person uh, took from uh, from that trauma in this case let's uh, imagine somebody who was um, treated in hospital uh, during the pan uh, COVID pandemic in an ICU unit and nobody was allowed to, to visit them as you will know. Um, but people, when they are that sick and in a state um, um, of being, uh, being very sick and also having lots of medication and so on, they might get into a kind of confusion state and be very confused about what's happening and not fully understand why nobody came to visit them and they might feel quite abandoned and they may take from this the, the meaning oh nobody really cares about me they would have come if they cared about me and then in the aftermath when friends uh, were trying to reach out to them and invite them or, or, or phone them they may actually avoid them and may really withdraw socially and, and not return their phone calls, which then means um, the friends will take that as a sign that this, their contact is unwanted and they get fewer invitations and fewer, fewer calls and which then confirms for, for this person, oh, nobody cares about me. So they might get in a vicious cycle like that. And we, we see that a lot with people that we treat for post-traumatic stress disorder, that breaking through these vicious cycles about meanings that um, um, people take from the trauma then um, influences understandably and, and in a logical way, you could say their behaviors, but that then prevents them really from testing out 
uh, their, their, that meaning and finding evidence against it. So it seems to confirm, the behavior seems to lead to, to a confirmation of these, these meanings, these distressing meanings. So breaking through these vicious cycles, uh, spotting them and breaking through these vicious cycles and then behaving differently to test out these meanings is an important way to get over trauma. One more example, um, uh, what gets in the way of recovery. I don't have a lot of time to think about, uh, to talk about the nature of trauma memories. There would be a lot to say about that, but, um, but um, uh, we, we, ha we don't have time for going into the de discussions about that. But what I would like to highlight is the sense of fear now that trauma memories have soon after the trauma and, and if people have chronic PTSD continuing for years and years, moments from a trauma popping into their mind when they don't want want to. And one important uh, lesson we learned when treating patients with this disorder and also from research is that it is useful to know about the triggers of these memories because they are, can be quite difficult to spot because they often don't have meaningful relationships. They, it's just about uh, sensations that were around at the time. And, and it's, it's really often uh, just one particular sensation. So it could be a particular color, a particular smell, a sound or taste. It could be touch somewhere in the body or a particular movement that they perceived or that they made themselves. And um, these can automatically trigger these very distressing memories that appear to be in the here and now. And it's also the case that because these memories are so distressing, people would usually then look away or try to avoid this uh, uh, the situation. And that makes it very difficult for them to spot any differences between the reminder that's there in the current situation that, that's not dangerous and the original trauma cues. And what uh, we can do there, and, and that's what we would also do in treatment when we treat people with PTSD is, is really working with uh, the person on what are the, the individual triggers. So and something we can see, hear, smell, taste, or feel in our body when a memory is triggered. And let, let's stay with the example of um, the, the uh, person who was treated in, in intensive care. So uh, there were many, many triggers. What one of them, for instance, uh, was the blue color that the NHS logo has. It's a kind of particular type of blue. And, um, and for this person, anything that hit this color blue would uh, trigger uh, intrusive memories of the ICU stay. So for instance, somebody walking on the street with a t-shirt in the same color would be a trigger, but there's no meaningful connection. T-shirts are not dangerous. And, um, but still spotting this relationship then would, would then help us to really look at what are all the differences between the then, the time of the trauma and the now, a person with a blue T-shirt. Um, and, and it's a completely different situation. They are now recovered or the, and, and they are better. They're not ill. Uh, it's a person in the street, they are not in hospital, so lots of differences. And, and then, so, so really zooming in, directing our attention to the differences can be really helpful in overcoming this automatic reaction of being triggered by these cues in everyday life that are harmless and, and uh, are linked with the trauma through this kind of sensory connection that we want to break. And this takes some practice, but, but uh, people find it really helpful. The last uh, one I wanted to mention is dwelling on the trauma. And I think Jennifer Wilde has already talked about the negative effects of dwelling. Uh, people may, after trauma, think about questions like, why did it happen to me? What if I only hadn't done this, or if I only had done this? And this can be feel quite compelling. They feel they should really to think about it more and, and it can come, to come in the kind of circular thinking about the trauma. 
which can really negatively affect uh, people's mood and also can keep the memories going. And uh, we advise um, to, to try to spot the, when you're getting into these ruminative circles early because it's easier to interrupt them when you're, when you're early on really spot them and then take them as a sign to get active. So even if it's something simple like getting a cup of tea or doing a little bit of exercise and to really get out of the vicious circle of, of uh, dwelling. And um, some people find it really useful to label it. Like I have a picture here of a carousel because as, as somebody thought that was a good image how the, how the thoughts go in circles or spaghetti thinking was, was another good label somebody uh, that we saw uh, came up with it's kind of all twisted up and and it leads nowhere it's kind of all all um, spaghetti <laughs> together um, so so spotting dwelling can be really helpful but i would also uh, i would like to finish now with saying if um if uh, somebody gets stuck in this natural recovery that is that is a very un, uh, also very understandable a consequence of trauma. And the good news is that help is available. So effective psychological treatments are available in the NHS and uh, psychological treatments are the first line treatments for this condition. If you're interested in, in, in that, there's uh, the NICE guidelines um, have um, uh, been published in 2018. You can look them up on the internet you, uh, if you want, think you might need some help, you can uh, discuss with, with your GP who can advise about the best options. You can also self-refer to your local improving access to psychological therapy service. Uh, in Oxford, that's called Talking Space Plus. And there is a service finder on the internet. If you Google IAP services, um, uh, NHS, then, then you can find it. A website where you put in your postcode and find your the services that are closest to you. And uh, there's also various uh, specialist trauma services and psychological treatment services in the NHS, depending on where you live, uh, where they, they can offer longer uh, treatments, especially for people who have very severe post-traumatic stress disorder or more complex uh, problems with, with several, several problems that need to be addressed. Thank you very much for your attention. Great, thank you ever so much indeed, Anka. Um, I'm now delighted to introduce our uh, fellow panel members. So I'd like to introduce you to Mina Fazel, who's Associate Professor in Child and Adolescent Psychiatry in the Department of Psychiatry here in Oxford, and also Morten Kringleback, who's Associate Professor of Neuroscience in the Department of Psychiatry and Senior Research Fellow at Queen's College London. Thanks for, uh, Queen's College Oxford, sorry. Thanks for joining us. I think I was in, um, in a, in a different mode there, apologies. Um, so we've received a number of questions um, which we're going to talk through. So just to start with, I'd like to come to you, Morton. Um, and I suppose this picks up on what Anka was saying about the range of different traumatic experience that people may have and the different effects they may have on different people. Um, and so there were some questions about what distinguishes kind of trauma with a, a capital T and other distressing experiences that we might not typically class as trauma. Um, and the, there were questions really about what research can tell us about this. So are there specific effects of the sort of capital T traumas? Um, and I guess ultimately, would we need to manage these different sorts of distressing events differently? Well, I mean, I think these are great questions. And of course, we are still looking at them. I think uh, Anka's wonderful talk sort of gets to the heart of that. Remember when she had showed her first slide, she said, trauma is the psychological experience of having trauma. Obviously there are degrees of the kind of trauma that you can go through. If you say I, in, a, in an accident, you may also hit your head. So of course there could both be the things that changes your brain, but also the things that changes your brain structurally. So obviously that would have a larger impact and may could well be what some people would class as trauma with a capital T. But the other thing that Anka also pointed out in her talk, which I think is a very important one, is the natural uh, time course of the disease, namely that uh, lots, of, lots of traumas will eventually go away or at least become better with time. And so what can neuroscience tell about it? Well, again, Anke again provided a wonderful sort of answer to that, namely that 
one of the things that goes away is the enjoyment of things. And one of the best things one can do is to actually enjoy things. In, in psychological lingo, we call it anhedonia and evolution, the, the lack of pleasure and the lack of wanting to do anything. And of course, what is happening here in the brain is that those circuits are being changed. Um, the question, of course, then is, are they changed differently because of you may have hit your head at the same time? There may be structural consequences of that. And the answer is absolutely. Um, certain things where you experience trauma potentially on a daily basis, like the military experience, is really a difficult one. And of course, I think the key issue here, depending on what it is that we experience, is how do we avoid going from acute to chronic? And this is exactly where the kinds of of treatments that, that Anke has outlined is exactly what is needed. And of course, it's very different if you try to treat somebody who is experiencing a chronic trauma every day of the week compared to somebody who's only had a one-off. So those are the kind of research questions that we are actually pursuing. Okay. Thanks very much, Morten. Mina, I don't know if you wanted to add anything in relation to this question about different sorts of trauma and distressing events. Well, yeah, absolutely. So I think what Anka talked about, about the subjective experience being crucial is that, you know, there are so many different events that could potentially lead one to subjectively experience that as traumatic. And I do think that it's an incredibly exciting time for research as well, because I think research is starting, well, has always played a key role, but is really starting to help unpick, you know, the natural course of um, what people experience and also the different types of interventions that might be able to help. And this is an area that's really growing. There are really incredible innovations. Um, we're learning a lot in Oxford as well as kind of across um, different institutions. And so I think it's a key time for research to help unpick like different vulnerabilities. There's also kind of neurodiversity and how different types of kind of brains and personality types might react. Um, to different events and then uh, you know what I'm interested in is then what does that mean on the ground for interventions like what does that mean for how services can better adapt so that we become you know easier for a person who as Anka really uh, you know clearly described as you know, avoidance is such a key part of this that you know no matter how much we understand about what's going on if a person is just going to avoid coming through the door to get an intervention, what can we do to help that? So I, I think um, there's so much, um, you know, so many different ways that trauma presents and also so, many, so much we can learn uh, about how we can tailor our interventions to really help. Thank you. And Morton, you, you talked there about um, neuroscience and the contribution of neuroscience to our understanding of trauma. Um, I wondered if there was anything else you wanted to add on that, because we did certainly have some specific questions about the contribution of neuroscience sort of as distinct from psychology and how it's contributing to our understanding. Well, one of my former students uh, now postdoc, Marina Balikea, uh, Balistair Shakiro um, was also a student of Anke. So we, we supervised a project where she had taken some of Anke's interventions and Anke had scanned the participants, patients before and after the intervention. So now we were able to track over time what happened to the brains as they were initially just looking at what happened when they had a traumatized images and then happened after they had successfully been been changed and very much like what Anke demonstrated with that wonderful example with the black cat what of course one of the key issues in trauma is that you keep basically doing what Anke calls spaghetti thinking this this idea that you are stuck in a, in a rot and the interesting thing was that once that she had carried out this very careful intervention, what you found in the brain was that suddenly the patients were able to disconnect from these traumatizing pictures. Instead of just taking over like the black cat, they went away. And of course, we now know exactly where that is happening in the brain. And we not only do we know where it's happening, but we also know the networks of how different things are communicating. And that I think is an exciting piece of work that should be replicated. And as Mina says, it's important that this actually has real effect on the ground. But again, taking into account the neurodiversity that Mina mentioned, I think it's, it's hugely important. Thank you. Really fascinating area. And um, I mean, there are a lot of questions really about the variation of experiences, the variation of the triggers, but also the variation of people's responses. And so there were particular questions about psychosomatic symptoms and whether um, we might see the impacts of trauma through psychosomatic symptoms, for example, pain? Um, and if so, how best to cope with that? Uh, Mina, can I come to you first of all? 
Yeah, so, you know, you know, as we're, you know, become aware today, there's all these emotional and cognitive reactions, but then that these experiences can also cause physical symptoms such as headaches, you know, digestive problems with nausea or diarrhea or fatigue or feeling jumpy. So there's a whole range of ways that the body can also kind of respond. And I think the first thing, you know, I want to say is that, you know, if you're getting headaches because of this, you know, these are really painful truly experienced you know symptoms and so the first thing is that this is you know not to dismiss it and say you know that this is not a real headache because it, it's causes and gets some organic psych you know pathology but um so the first thing is that you know to be aware that trauma can affect everybody differently and for some people that might have manifestations in these physical symptoms but then what to do about it i think to know that there's no magic bullet, that actually understanding that this is actually quite common, isn't it, you know, helpful. What we call psychoeducation is such a basic part of starting to address it. That um, we often say this is really, you should think about it as a software problem rather than a hardware problem. And, and so, you know, we can actually through a range of different um, methods and, um, in a way, a very multidisciplinary approach, we would talk about it in, in services, um, really help uh, a person overcome it. And so a lot of what Anka already talked about, so not to kind of um, forget the really important, just basic principles of the importance of all those self-care um, things, the importance of interpersonal relationships and the roles that friends and family can play, maintaining your social networks, but also just believing that these kind of um, ways just help adapt, adapt better. It's not saying that that headache isn't there. It's not saying that it's not painful. It's just saying the way we can help the body cope better, the way we can shift that software you know, problem a little bit is by um, ensuring that you maintain the breadth of other activities that could maybe assist in that overall recovery. Thanks very much. We, we had several questions about issues relating to stigma. And I mean, that's something that obviously comes up across a lot of our, our sessions that people may feel stigma themselves uh, because of their the experiences that the traumatic experience they've had um, and or because of um, the experiences they've had subsequently or may feel that they've experienced stigma from others around them. So there were some questions really about what research can tell us about the impact of stigma associated with trauma. And, and what people can do to be able to cope or, or overcome that. So Anka, can I come to you first for your thoughts on yes, that? Yes, um, so I think we can look at it at uh, two levels, as you said. One is the perceived stigma that the person themselves says they, they may feel that uh, well, if they talk about the trauma to others, they, that might be, they might feel quite ashamed about it and might then uh, not disclose about it to other people and uh, they might think people will look down on them. That's very, very common um, and understandable. Um, and and uh, what we would uh, advise there is that uh, it is possible that that is, is one of the vicious cycles that I talked about, that, that we just assume other people would uh, look down on us or would, would uh, not think badly. So, and so to to really um, check it out um, and um, and and try to talk to some trusted friend and 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 you and often you people will find that people are much more understanding than they thought. But I don't want to deny that there is still um, a, 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 some society to stigma. I think it's getting better about mental health in general and also particularly about trauma. Many. Uh, people start now speaking out about traumas they experienced. And I think this will cause a, a shift in the perception of a trauma. And, and also I think the numbers that we've seen, it, it will happen to most people in their lifetime. So it's not an only happened to a few, a few people. So it, it is, it is uh, uh, but that's, that needs more work. And also uh, uh, the uh, like reactions of other people are not always helpful. I mean, most, most people will be helpful, but we can't deny that some of the people, at least the ones we, that we've seen in, in treatment have reported with negative reactions from other people. And I think education about the effect of trauma 
uh, has has to be also part of the package. Thank you. Thanks very much. And um, we've got one last question, and I'd like to come to each of you um, for your for any final thoughts and reflections stimulated by this question. So um, I'll come to you, Mina Morton, and then Anka. And, and this was really relating to the question about recovery. And obviously, Anka, you presented that uh, graph, which very clearly showed the sort of natural pattern of recovery. But I, but one question that we received was whether it's ever possible to really reach a stage where you're unaffected by severe trauma that you've experienced, including possibly uh, trauma that you've experienced in childhood, um, whether you can ever get to a point where you're unaffected by that. Um, so Mina, can I come to you first of all for your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, it's a really important question. And I think it um, comes to the heart of, you know, many people have experienced trauma and either they might be more worried about hearing that it's always going to affect them negatively rather than, you know, just looking at the reality of their life and how it is affecting them. I would say that, you know, all experience affects you. So I would be really nervous to say you're unaffected, but the assumption that that effect is negative, we just have to, you know, question. So I do think that we don't want to minimize people's pain and suffering and the impact of losses that might have caused trauma. And you know, many people are very negatively affected, but we also have to, you know, respect the fact that some people as a result of terrible events do shift their worldview in a way that they later perceive um, in, in a more positive light. So, so I think everyone is likely to be affected. I'm affected by almost everything that happens, good, bad, and soon, somewhat mundane. So not to worry about being affected. Um, and I'm also, you know, a psychiatrist, like we're all clinicians here. So I do actually think that in the most severe cases as well, there are treatments that exist that are incredibly effective. And so even, you know, that, that actually it is, you know, that these are, you know, interventions that can help. And it's important that people who are the most negatively affected often, you know, are able to access these treatments because I do think that can help. Thanks very much, Mina. Morton? Yeah, I think neuroscience clearly shows that your brain will be changed by everything. Some, of course, more negatively than others. But I think the evidence is also that you can shift from constantly thinking about that cat on your shoulder to actually use that something. And I think it's also important, like Mina said, to remember that true flourishing is often very closely associated with suffering. It's often by going through terrible things that we come to new ways of actually appreciating and flourishing in this life. So yes, I think there are very effective treatments. We need to know more, obviously more research is needed, but I think there is possibility for change. Thank you. And finally to you, Anka. Yeah, I agree, I agree with what Nina Morton said. You can't really erase a memory. It will always, it will always stay a memory of a bad event. Um, and I think what, what I can add is that it might also be helpful to be prepared that, that there might be particular reminders like the anniversaries and so on that will come with a temporary phase where one thinks more about it and feel and remember the, the bad events, but then also take that as a, taking that as a sign to re-engage with life and, and, and uh, what, uh, what life brings now. Um, and and also some potential growth, like Morton said, people report that they feel they are more, they've seen positive changes in themselves, like being more empathetic of other people, enjoying the good times more. So that can also be, be an outcome and that's uh, important. And obviously we also have to acknowledge that some people lost in the trauma, may lost, have lost in people they loved and, and that will always be a loss that has changed their life forever. We, we, we have to accept reality, but that doesn't mean um, that we have to be stuck in the intrusive memories and, and the symptoms of PTSD. Thanks very much. So that brings us to a close today. So I'd just like to say a huge thank you to all our speakers and panelists for joining us today for a really interesting and I hope um, very useful session for everyone who's joined us. Uh, also a huge thanks to everybody who joined us and also to Kaya and Hallie who've done lots of work behind the scenes to make this all run really smoothly and of course thanks to the Department of Experimental Psychology for hosting this series. As I mentioned do have a look at the Experimental Psychology Department website 
website or our YouTube channel for past talks and this talk will also be available there. And just a last reminder that on the 20th of May at 2pm we'll be running the next session on, on overcoming mistrust and paranoia so please do join us for that I'm sure it'll be a really interesting session. So thanks ever so much please do take a little break now before you move on to what you need to be doing next and um, give yourself a bit of time for a, a stretch or a walk or a cup of tea whatever would be good for you and we look forward to seeing you again thanks ever so much goodbye